pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Is it ever fantastic to be outside? I got my big expensive microphone working again and I bought it at Took. So there's the first word of the day. This is, in other words, an occasional series where I talk about words and gr interesting grammatical patterns in the fiction that I read. It's the third one I've done and uh, I'm a little bit behind. I'm backlogged with vocabulary I've been jotting down, but what with weddings and illnesses and whatnot, I'm, I, uh, and uh, read readathons and this and that, I uh, uh, need to catch up. So here I am. And yes, toque is a Canadian, the Canadian word for a knit cap. I think it might even be only Western Canada, but I can't remember. It's a French word originally, but I got a toque for my for my rear phone, which should cut down on wind and stuff. Mel of Mel's Bookland Adventure recommended that I, that I track one down for this size of mic months ago when I finally did. Plus, I got a new cord and it works with my old iPad. I'm gonna buy a new iPad any day now. But in the meantime, the uh, Yeti Blue microphone is uh, back in business so I can record outside and uh, whatnot. So here I am. So I have uh, seven or eight uh, words or expressions to talk about today and uh, let's get started. So some of these are going way back two months or more, uh, especially this one, Robinson, which was Muriel Sparks' second novel, first published in 1958. I hated this novel passionately and it kind of turned me off reading Muriel Spark uh, <laughs> for, for a few years, but uh, anyway, be that as it may, there was one interesting phrase that I jotted down from Robinson. And that was, to the manor born. She talks about nursing, the protagonist nursing a guy after the airplane crash, and she says that she found herself becoming snappy and sharp with him, as to the manor born. As to the manor born. So the spelling is important. Manor is M-A-N-N-E-R. And this is an idiom that means destined to be suited to something by virtue of birth or custom or practice. I bet many of you are f more familiar with the other spelling to the manor born, M-A-N-O-R, which uh, also exists and circulates uh, idiomatically within the language, and it stresses a noble birth, man the manor house, M-A-N-O-R. The first one came, the M-A-N-N-E-R idiom came first, and some people think the M-A-N-O-R version of this idiom was kind of a play on words or perhaps a mishearing slash misspelling uh, like I said both are have been the language for many years they think the original one was coined by Shakespeare in Hamlet Horatio says is it, is it a custom Hamlet answers a Mary is it but to my mind though I am native here and to the manner born it is a custom more honored in the breach than the observance so that spelling is M-A-N-N-E-R. Interesting. One of my uh, fabulous discoveries and probably will end up being within my top 10 reads of the year is this novel by Cynthia Proper Seton, The Sea Change of Angela Lewis, a 1971 novel out of America. And this is not a useful word. I just thought it was an interesting word. I'd never encountered it before. And there's quite a bit made in the plot of this story about various women's climacteric which comes from the Greek word meaning critical point or rung of a ladder so in English it re have you ever heard of it in, in English it refers to those in inevitable big moments on the metaphorical ladder of life in fact there's some kind of numerological blah 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 gobbledygook the major climacterics were thought to happen in years denoted by multiples of seven or nine or only in the odd multiples of seven the 63rd year of life was the considered the grand or the great climacteric nowadays when it's used at all i don't think it's used very widely it, it can refer to male or female menopause male menopause is that a thing that explains a lot 
But uh, yeah, kind of a silly uh, pedantic word, but uh, sometimes pedantic words float my boat. I read this gorgeous novel, or, or, or whatever the heck it was, Pond by Claire Louise Bennett, uh, a couple months back. 2016 uh, release. Uh, Bennett, it lives in Ireland, but I'm actually not sure of her ethnic background. I kind of have a feeling that she might not be Irish. So it might end up being relative, relevant to the words that I dug out here. The first one was uh, the protagonist talk, talks slash writes a lot about food, and uh, one was burgoo, which is a thick uh, stew or soup, typically served at an outdoor meal. As a nautical term, it is, refers to a thick porridge. Anyway, I'm not much of a seasonal person. I don't notice sea changes, season changes, sea change. I don't notice season changes all that much. But yeah, now it's October. I feel like a thick stew or a thick soup. And I'd never heard of burgoo. Does anybody know what's supposed to be in it? The, ne the other one that I found in Pond was Scrapple, which comes from... And it also denotes food, although neither of the instances that uh, where Bennett uses it does it refer to food, but just given her predilection for writing about food, I thought I'd start with that. Also called in Pennsylvania Dutch pan has or pan rabbit. And it's traditionally a mush of pork scraps and trimmings, cornmeal, wheat flour, or buckwheat flour, spices. And it's formed into a semi-solid congealed loaf and slices of the scrapple are then pan fried before serving. That actually sounds a little bit disgusting. I'll show you a picture, you be the judge. I think months ago when I made this list I did Google the the image of the of the dish and I wasn't quite so eager to eat scrapple. However, as a verb or a noun, uh, it's getting a little bit closer to the sense in which pond is using it and you can kind of see how it connects to the to the food. A scrapple is a tool for scraping so you can hear the the kind of etymological cousinship scrape scrapple. So as a verb it means to scrape or grub around. But the two instances I found in pond neither of them kind of get at grubbing around or only a little bit. First one is on page 51 and she has a lot of uh, paragraph long little meditations or something in between the longer chapters and this one's called wishful thinking. So it starts pads upstairs scrapples around beneath ottoman locates green flip-flop so scrapples about beneath ottoman there's a sense of searching and I guess if you're using your hand, you're kind of scraping. But I haven't found any dictionary definition that kind of really encompasses this meaning completely. But I, I can envision the, the leap, the uh, semantic leap between scraping and looking under, the, looking under the piece of furniture to find something. That makes sense. The only other reference that I noticed in, the, in Pond was to Scrapple was she's kind of writing... Uh, you know, kind of a navel-gazing way about inviting other people to come in in her own skin and feel what it's like to be her. But an invitation of this sort achieves nothing, worse than nothing. It comes to them as a threat, a threat they scrapple to keep at bay by tethering worn-out schemes of placid coziness about the place. So that's lifting a quote out of a longer paragraph, but to me, they scrapple to keep the threat at bay doesn't really fit with scraping at something or hurt searching for something. It's kind of defend. It's kind of like this stop, stop action it is what I get. So any of you who are Irish or, you know, or in from the UK and you can kind of help me make the bridge there for scrapple because it's an interesting word that seems to be taking on more meanings uh, over time. So you know, it was a completely new word for me. Okay, this is a curious how I got to find this word. When I was browsing in the McNally Robinson bookstore in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan in August, I noticed a gorgeous, huge collection of short stories by a Brazilian writer I had never 
heard of. And the uh, closest, the, the best I can do with the Portuguese slash Brazilian pronunciation of his name is Joaquin Maria Machado de Assis. I'll re- print his name at the bottom because uh, I think native English speakers probably have a much uh, uh, more uh, much offler <laughs> pronunciation, and mine's probably not the greatest. But yeah, Joaquin Maria Machado de Assis. And he uh, lived from 1839 to 1908, and he's kind of regarded as the father of Brazilian literature. I'd never heard of him. And there's a new 800-page collection of his short stories. And I almost bought it, but I thought, no, I don't know anything about him, so I did some due diligence. And on Scrib, they had a shorter collection of his short fiction, so I read one of the stories in there. The title of the book was Midnight Mass, and other stories. I don't remember the name of the story I read and whether it was the translation or whatever, it didn't really float my boat. But there's a reference in that story. So here's where we get to the phrase, to Buridan's ass, donkey ass, or uh, not, not not the part of the body, but the animal. And this is interesting. So have any of you heard of Buridan's ass? Again, I'm not talking anatom anatomy here, people. (laughs) That's another video. Stay tuned. It's named after a French philosopher, so named Jean Buridan, and the paradox is a way of satirizing that philosopher's moral determinism. Okay, well, we're getting into lofty philosophy. I hate philosophy, but still, this is an interesting term. An ass that is as hungry as it is thirsty and that is placed exactly halfway between a pail of oats and a pail of water will die of both thirst and hunger if, as the paradox assumes, it will always go to the closer pail. Well, I kind of like that, but it seems like it's mostly satirical anyway, but uh, it also kind of describes the uh, state of paralysis in which I often find myself in my life. So there you go. I'm a I'm a I'm a Buridan's ass maybe. I absolutely love this novel translated from the Norwegian Alberta and Jacob by Cora Sandel. It was written in the 1920s and translated in 1962 by Elizabeth Rokan. She uses the curious phrase that a character in the novel goes teetotal. Now teetotaler is a word that I've known since I was a kid because my grandparents the, that grew up, that I grew up with on the farm, they were teetotalers. And mum and dad had to go to great lengths to, uh, to imbibe alcohol without them noticing. Uh, my grandma loosened up in her 80s and would drink a little bit of wine and things like that. But uh, no, they were very strict about alcohol. Teetotalers their whole life until, like I say, my grandma was well into her 80s. I did a little research today and it's pretty interesting. So when the temperance movement started, and I believe it was in the early 19th century, if you became temperate, it meant you gave up hard liquor, spirits, whiskey and whatnot, but you were still allowed to drink wine and beer. They were okay. It was the hard stuff that got you into trouble. And then a man, I didn't know his name because the, the historical record is not clear that it in fact was him who invented the, the word teetotaler or, to, or the verb teetotal. But it's kind of like vegan compared to vegetarian. He said, no way, no alcohol of any kind, and that is teetotaling. And a person who doesn't drink alcohol of any kind is a teetotaler. But why teetotal? Again, nobody knows, but there's some fun, fun theories. One is that Mr. I think he was Webster, Mr. Webster, whatever his name was, his grave credit, the, the inscription on his headstone credits him as having invented the word teetotaler. So how much proof is that? But some people uh, theorize that he had a stutter, so he would say teetotal, teetotal. Total means totally no alcohol, but teetotaler. I don't want to make fun of people with speech impediments, I'm not, but that's one theory. It's kind of far-fetched, but nobody knows exactly where the word came from, but that is what it means. And it came out of the temperance movement when people went half-assed and said, oh yeah, I don't drink hard stuff, but beer and wine's okay, and uh, 
whoever it was, said, no way, no alcohol of any kind, and that is a teetotaler. So in this novel, somebody goes teetotal. So teetotal uh, can be an adjective, too, but it's not common. I've never, I'd never heard of it that way. Another book that I read and, very m and didn't like very much was a Monica Dickens novel, The Upstairs Room. But there was one thing that I noted from that book, and this is going to be a little bit of a longer thing. Bec uh, one character says to the other, don't say gotten. So that's interesting. So Monica Dickens was British writer, but lived for decades in America. And so she has one of her characters say to the other, and this is a st and this particular novel is set in New England, but and, and all of the characters are American, and, they, and one says to the other, "Don't say gotten." Well, this set off a uh, me going down a rabbit hole because as a grammar teacher, I have been trying to figure out, and as a Canadian speaker of the language, I have been trying to figure out gotten, gotten. And I finally found an article, and I'm not going to review the whole thing. I'll put a link to it if you're a grammar geek and you want to go down that rabbit hole. But this article basically uh, helped me make sense of it. In British Eng in modern British English, gotten is, or for for centuries, gotten has been since the 17 since 17 around 1700. Gotten has fallen out of favor, and it's always got. So, get, got, got. In American English, and I can't remember when the article said that it started to come into American English, gotten became a separate uh, past participle of the verb get. And, better pull it up so I don't make a mistake here. In situations where you're talking about possessing something or needing something, the past participle is got. For example, I've got a Volkswagen. It means I have a Volkswagen. In, Brit in American, modern American English, you have got to see that movie. You have got to see that movie. In American English or Canadian English, we would never say, you have gotten to see that movie. And again, that would translate that to the other perfectly acceptable phrase, you have to see that movie. It would be, you have got to, never you have gotten to. I've got a Volkswagen, never I have gotten a Volkswagen. But I'll come back to I have gotten a Volkswagen in a minute. And again, I'm talking about modern British, uh, modern American English people. So that's possessing or needing something. But when you're talking about a dynamic uh, situation, for example, acquiring something or becoming something, in modern American English and in Canadian English, we use gotten. So I've gotten a Volkswagen means I've, I've, I have bought one, I have acquired one which is very different from saying, I've got a Volkswagen, which means I'd simply that I, I have one, I possess it. So this article doesn't talk about it, but basically when you, uh, the other thing that I would say as a Canadian speaker of English is, I would never say, like this week, this month I lost weight. So uh, to say that I am now thin is a bit of a stretch, but just work with me for the purpose of the example. I got thin, I would never say I got thin to mean I became thin. I've gotten thin, and never I've got thin, as a Canadian speaker. I got thin would mean in the past I became thin. Okay, this is a little confusing, I don't want to say any more than that, I really like feedback and please when you give feedback if you don't if I don't know you well please tell me where you grew up which country been and how how weird does this sound to you does this sound right to you the article also explains that of course there was gotten in British English in the in the good old days but around 1700 it, uh, it became got only 
So, and now it's coming back into British English because of American English, and that's how language grows and changes. But interesting. Monica Dickens having her character say, Don't use gotten. I think that was a bit of a British slip up. All right. That's it for uh, this installment of In Other Words. I hope to uh, scrapple together some burgoo for dinner, but I haven't been able to drink alcohol because of my little uh, bug that I've picked up this month that's still not gone. So uh, I hope to get back to uh, c- imbibing copious amounts of wine as to the manner born. But maybe this will end up being a climacteric and I'll become a teetotaler. Oh my god! Now imagine me with a bowl of burgoo there and a glass of dry white wine there. Talk about Buridan's ass! Thanks for watching.